meeting of the Revere City Council. Will all reasons rise and salute the flag, please? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call of the members, Councillor Cogliandro. Here. Here, Councillor Morabito. Here. Here, Councillor Nobosalski. Here. Here, Councillor Powers. Here. Here, Councillor Rizzo. Here. Here, Councillor Serino. Here. Here, Councillor Silvestri. Here. Here, Councillor Visconti. Here. Here, Councillor Zambudo. Here. Here, and President McKenna. Here. Here, quorum is present. Approval of the journal of the regular meeting of November 27th. All in favor, all opposed, so ordered, accepted. Calendar item number three, motion presented by Councilor Silvestri that the City Council awards certificates of merit to Officer Brandon Leslie, Officer Christopher Panzini, and Sergeant Jackie Dean in recognition of receiving the Trooper George L. Hanna Memorial Award. Congratulations. Stand right here. Stand right here. Congratulations. So tonight's uh, one of my favorite things to do here as a city councilor is recognize when uh, residents or, or employees and staff, um, but more importantly when our first responders act in a manner of that ex exemplifies bravery and uh, a professional manner that, that we look to in police officers. Um, <laughs> And going back to the day in April, uh, Friday evening, when um, officers Leslie and Panzini were walking their beat on um, Broadway, they came across a man who was armed and violent. And they engaged the man, they talked with him, they, they worked in, in trying to de-escalate. Um, and in doing so, uh, the gentleman raised, he fired, and um, Officer Leslie fired back. And in that time, um, until you've had uh, an experience when you're shot at, you don't know how you're going to respond. And we all hope for the best, and when an officer pulls his weapon, we don't always get the results that we're looking for. And this day, he, he pulled his weapon, he fired back, he shot the assailant in the leg, it was non-fatal, they were able to apprehend him, and in doing so, they were re we received and bestowed uh, some amazing awards from our state, uh, the, the, the George Hanner Award. George Hanner was a state trooper who was killed in 1983, and now they recognize uh, police officers from all over the state of Massachusetts um, for their exemplary acts. Um, and tonight, we're going to recognize officers Panzini, in recognition of receiving the Trooper L. Hanna Memorial Award for valor, your actions on April 8, 2022, wherein you observed a man who was armed with a handgun acting erratically in the middle of Broadway, obstructing traffic and waving his arms near a bus stop. You went above and beyond the call of duty and risked your life to de-escalate a dangerous situation, arrest the subject, and prevent your fellow officers, motorists, pedestrians from being seriously injured or killed. Your professional and courage and bravery will always be remembered. In witness of whereof the certificate of merit is greatly bestowed by the mayor and city councilor in the city of Revere of Massachusetts on behalf of its citizens this fourth day of December in the year of our Lord, 2003, the year of independence, the United States of America, 247th. Thank you, Officer Panzini. So in recognition, Officer Brandon Leslie for the 
for the Trooper George L. Hanna Memorial Award Medal of Honor for your award and actions on April 8th, wherein you observed a man um, acting erratically and in the middle of Broadway obstructing traffic and waving his arms at a bus stop. You went above and beyond the call of duty, risking your life to de-escalate a dangerous situation, arrest the subject, and prevent your fellow officers, motorists, and pedestrians from seriously injured or killed. Your professional courage and bravery will always be remembered, and witness of their certificate of merit is gratefully bestowed by the mayor and the city council of the city of Revere, Massachusetts, on behalf of the citizens this 40. 44th, this fourth day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023, in the independence of the United States of America, 247th. Officer Brennan Leslie, Leslie thank you for your actions and duty. Thank you very much. Calendar item number four, Brian Dakin, Senior Project Manager of Left Field, will, will provide an update to the City Council relative to the ongoing Revere High School project. And state your name and address, please, for sure, the record. Brian, Brian Dakin, 1 High Street. Thank you for your time. Um, Ashley, you're good to go. You have a file, yeah, right? Let me, okay. Uh, Sounds good. So as the slides are coming up, I um, just wanted to start out here. As you know, the high school project's been, um, been working in what's called the preferred schematic report phase. The goal of the preferred schematic report is to um, study all available options, put prices and schedules to all the available options, and ultimately to, to select an option to proceed into schematic design with. Uh, at the prior council meeting, I think last month, we ran through the three new options, uh, four-story, five-story, and six-story scheme that were being studied. Um, and I would note again that um, per MSBA requirements, studying an addition renovation is required, and just putting a schedule in budgets to a code upgrade is, um, is required. So there were five options, three of which were the ones that um, were most appealing to the committees that have all seen this. Uh, tonight, we wanted to come in front of the council and um, more or less do an update. The second slide would be great, Ashley. Uh, we want to come before the council and give you an update on um, how we see the schedules and budgets for both of these options. Um, and in the coming month to two months, we'll be proceeding with establishing a preferred option. Uh, we owe the MSBA a decision on what that preferred option is by February 28th. And there's a couple of really important items uh, that we're going to talk about as I get through the small handful of slides um, tonight. Don't worry, it's not a 30-slide deck tonight. A um, couple of pieces that we really need to uh, have a little more work done on and do a little research before we're ready to proceed uh, with asking the committees to pick. Next slide, please. So first off, schedule. Uh, in a way, this is... From a certain perspective, this is the easier part uh, in that all of the five options on this site, the four, five, six story schemes, the ad reno, and the option to just bring the building up to code more or less have the same schedule. Um, it'll take the same amount of time to implement. Uh, however, I'm going to start talking about one of the challenges that we've been working on last month, this month, and we'll be working into next month. And it's a topic we've talked about uh, before, and it's the culvert. 
Uh, there's a big assumption baked into all of these schedules, uh, and that's that that project and process can get far enough along so that whatever needs to happen underground between School Street and American Legion Highway is designed and ready to be implemented in 2025 and 2026. That right now is not a sure thing. Um, the culvert team um, is working directly with the city, separate project from us, separate group. Uh, CDM Smith is the engineer leading that. We've had a number of meetings with them. And right now, these schedules are based on the assumption that that process from a design and engineering point of view can get far enough along that the high school project wouldn't have to wait for it. What they did, um, one of our goals this year in laying out the designs on the existing site was effectively to keep the new building off of the culvert. We have done that, um, kept a 30-foot swath on either side of where that culvert is to basically avoid being on top of it. Uh, CDM Smith's advice, however, was um, they don't recommend implementing the tens of millions of dollars of site work we'd be putting over it, not a building, but site work, because that pipe, that system, I don't want to talk about it as a pipe because it is an entire system, is, um, is going to need to be replaced at some point sooner rather than later. So our efforts uh, right now are to let their process catch up. They're early in their process, their feasibility study. We need to let them reach some schematic level of conclusion of where that pipe's going to run, how far underground, how big, when it can be implemented to really verify that the schedules and budgets we're putting in front of you tonight uh, survive uh, unscathed and don't potentially either mean this project would have to wait for the culvert project to either get to the site, whether it's working from the west towards the ocean or vice versa, that's something they'd have to figure out. And could this site be remedied um, while the upstream and downstream portions of that drainage system perhaps aren't uh, fixed yet? So that's the main moving target that we're still really trying to work with is coordinating with this culvert. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, next slide, we'll talk about it further in a minute. Um, in the package that you folks got, in the, the handout package, I included the design slides that we just went through at the last meeting. Um, this is a construction logistics slide prepared by Consigli. It's pretty much the same for all the new options. That's one of the three uh, new options shown in the bottom right. Um, the other item that we're working on is the, towards the end here is really figuring out exactly how Ambrose Field would have to be utilized. One of Consigli's conclusions you can see in the dead center of this screen is in order to build this building, they would need to take over the ex most of the existing parking lot at the high school site where it says lay down that sort of pink box in the middle. That's all staging area to maintain a full loop around the building for crane and vehicular uh, access for um, construction logistics. So we would need to take most of that parking lot over and the plan would have to be that we replace temporary parking on Ambrose Field for the duration that we'd need it, and then ultimately put Ambrose Field right back as a baseball diamond when this new building is open and the new parking lot's open, the, the old building's knocked down, et cetera, the whole site's done. So right now, what we're analyzing is how many cars we can get over there. It's probably somewhere in the realm of 300 to 350 cars, and most of that, that's either going to replace the teacher and student parking that would be displaced, or it would provide contractor parking. It's not gonna be able to fit both. So we are laying out that parking area and we'll be working more with the school and the city and Consigli to determine how many spots could we have on site and who's parking there. That's gonna definitely require a bit of work because again, the, the three to 400 cars that are gonna to take to build this building and the 250 to 300 cars that we would be displacing by taking that parking lot away all of them won't fit there. So this is one of the two challenges that we're really uh, looking at. The other, I already mentioned the culvert, that's that sort of bright cyan, blue-green sort of line that runs right through the site there. It feeds on most everything between the hills and West Revere, between Fenno and Malden Street. Almost everything drains through this point, and it's a good part here to sort of see um, how it impacts schedule. We really need to um, see where that team is and see what our options are on implementing this piece of the culvert. If their engineering decisions state that upstream work or downstream work would need to be done first, then perhaps the schedule that we've put in front of you tonight could slip back um, until that work's done. Right now, we're hoping that we can really thread the needle and get the work done on this site uh, in a manner that 
we don't have to wait for that culvert work to get all the upstream work between all the hills in West Revere and all the downstream work where it goes down to the MBTA tracks and dead ends up in the marsh towards Lynn. Um, so those are, those are the biggest pieces that prevent us from saying the schedules that we're showing you tonight and the budgets we're showing you tonight are finalized. If this project didn't have another large, complex municipal project running right through it, I'd be calling what we have on the screen tonight finalized. Uh, until we know more about that culvert, when it can be, Im be implemented, what its design is, who's going to put it in the ground, how does it, how does it really um, work, coexist peacefully with six years of construction on this site. Those are big questions that we still need to work out a bit more. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of, we've mostly touched on schedule. Um, they're neutral between all of them, but the schedule's still to some degree up in the air because of the culvert. Costs. Um, we ran um, through October and November, we ran estimates, two dueling estimates. Consigli did one of the estimates, the architects estimated did another one. They were all reconciled to within about two tenths of a percent of each other, which on a job of this size is pretty magnificent. That means the estimators are seeing the same scope, they understand what the job is. Uh, and the other big change between uh, any time we've talked costs before and tonight is in October, the MSBA board pretty much fundamentally changed the um, reimbursement metrics. They moved the, um, a significant jump in the building square foot cap from $393 a square foot to 550. And the way they calculate reimbursable site work went from $39 a square foot to 55. These all result in um, a much better grant than we were seeing at any other part of this process. Uh, these new numbers are applicable to this, um, this project. We've captured them in the, in the slide that we'll see um, in one or two slides, and overall that is um, very good news, but I did just want to, if people look back into other work that's been done in the last few years, this deal looks about 10% better, that's why. It's not necessarily because of the site where the building is, the design of the building, it's because of the MSBA reimbursement metrics have changed in October. Next slide, please. So the three major items, other than other than pricing the building and site work as designed, we've got three major variables on this site that do need more work. The first, I already talked about Ambrose Field parking. Consigli's estimate to turn that into a temporary parking lot for a number of years and then put it back as a grass ball field is 4.2 million. Uh, that would be required. It, as, a, as I stated earlier, it wouldn't fit everybody though. So we still have to work out exactly what that impact will be. The culvert replacement, these number, this number came from, um, that's a CMD Smith, it's a typo, I'm sorry, CDM Smith is their name. Um, that is a loose estimate based on what they believe is going to need to be done between School Street and American Legion Highway. That's not west of School Street, that's not east of American Legion Highway, that's a piece of the puzzle that they're working on. And right now, that's the biggest variable. It's a huge cost variable, as you can tell here, the estimate uh, runs, they put us somewhere in the realm of twenty dollars to $25,000 a linear foot to build what needs to be put underground at that site. It's not just a pipe, it's huge. Um, cost is one impact, but really the schedule is the bigger impact. Until that process is further on and has a defined schedule that they will be able to get bid documents for, get a contractor for the area at least outside of School Street, to American Legion Highway and get any work done that from an engineering point of view would need to happen before we fix what's on this site. The schedule is the bigger driver, the bigger challenge here. Uh, obviously it is a cost driver too. Uh, lastly, the designs you've seen, as I noted at the last meeting, uh, currently do not have a freestanding administrative office, district office building in the parking lot. Uh, there's really nowhere to put it in the new designs. It would, the only places we could really sort of put it in or way upstairs, not an ideal uh, place to have a district office. So it can't attach to the footprint of the new building. There's a few numbers on here. $9 million is what our estimators would say, a building a building of that size in the parking lot um, after the new high school's built would be their new construction estimate. And $5 million is a loose estimate for the, the city to potentially uh, find a different spot to put that uh, district admin. Because again, all of these options would tear down the old building, which is the admin office, where the admin office is. So we would look in a future phase to have a decision made by the school and the city on the admin office. Um, it is a cost one way or the other to set up that office somewhere else, whether it's a new building that this project handles or some other space somewhere else that the city and school tackle on their own. 
Uh, if it's in the project and if it's new, $9 million is the estimate. If it's outside of the project, um, that's something that we'd want to know about in schematic design in the next phase. And uh, if the city was going to solve that somewhere, some, some other way that was outside of this project, you would uh, then not hear me talking about it ever again. But it's definitely something that would have to be followed through on before we take that old building offline. Uh, next and last slide for now, and then we'll stop for some questions. There's a lot of numbers on the screen, but these are the cost estimates with reimbursement for the on top, the three new schemes on this site, the four-story courtyard four is what it's called, the five-story schemes in the middle, and the six-story schemes on the upper right. On the bottom left is the addition renovation of keeping the field house, attaching a new building to it, and then simply bringing the building up to codes on the bottom right. Um, if you want to really get to the bottom line, the costs highlighted in blue uh, are the important ones. What we're looking at is a range from total project cost $550.2 million for the four-story scheme uh, up to $557 million for the six-story scheme. Uh, the way this worked out based on the designs is the building does get more expensive, not less expensive as it goes up. And you're sort of seeing down on the bottom with the ad reno scheme that you really not saving uh, a ton of money for going at uh, keeping the field house and building a new building around it. The light blue is the cost to revere. So the, the number in between them, the max MSBA grant, those are the numbers that have gone up based on that um, increase in MSBA reimbursement. I think last time we were putting numbers in front of you, your effective reimbursement rate was high 30s. It's in the high 40s now uh, after you calculate all the ineligible scope. So um, it creates a range of cost to revere after the um, MSBA grant. Keep in mind those three independent items, uh, the parking, temp parking, culvert, and whatever happens to the admin building are not reimbursable. They do not impact the grant. Sets up a range of cost to revere for um, the four, courtyard four scheme is 310 million, 315 for the five story scheme, 317 for the six story scheme. So, as I noted, we definitely have more work to do with the Culver team, with Don, um, with the city, to really get better resolution on the culvert running through this site. Until we know that can happen in the time frame and in the sequence that we have planned here, that threading the needle I said earlier, uh, we can't stand by these schedules and budgets. We really need to understand when that project's going to be ready to go, uh, what it means, and how we can work with it and around it. But otherwise, at this point, we do have designs for the options, we have schedules, we have budgets, and we're hoping that um, in advance of the February 28th deadline that we will arrive at a new preferred option and then proceed into a schematic design phase that would run through next July, August, um, at which point we would be back to presenting final schematic design costs. And that's the point at which uh, a project vote would need to authorize uh, borrowing, funding, and um, ultimately enter into a project funding agreement with MSBA. So we're still one phase ahead of that, making it all official, uh, but we're making progress on the, um, on the preferred schematic report second lap here. So I'll stop and uh, see if anybody has any questions. Councilors, any questions? Councilor Silvestri. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Mr. Thank Dagan, thank you very much. Um, so... In taking over Ambrose Park and making that a, a temporary parking lot for, I guess, the course of the project, would that mean all traffic would enter Ambrose Park down Permona Street? Because I, I, where, would, where would the cars start coming in and out of that? Right now, a little bit TBD, that's, we're having our uh, landscape designers lay that out and help figure that out. I personally would like to rig that lot up that it all comes off American Legion Highway, period. And I think that's the way we'd approach it. If somehow that couldn't work, we'd have to talk with everyone about other ideas. But to me, it should all come off American Legion Highway. <clears throat> I, I agree there. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Everyone knows where I, I stood on the, on the projects of the high school. Um, and and now the 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 numbers just keep escalating and in forty millions for coverage. We're losing more playing fields. I think we opened up a can and and this is uh looking disastrous, but whatever. Thank you.
Thank you, Council. Councilor Powers. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have a one central question. And uh, when we did the Rumney Marsh Academy, we found that there were collapsed lines running under American Legion Highway, uh, going down uh, under the uh, the uh, Power Vier School, uh, adjacent to the Power Vier School, and then eventually going to the uh, Central County Ditch. Okay. Would these lines be interrupted? Would they have to be changed? Are we going to get any value from those lines? Are they going to affect the people on Easton, Tapley, True, and School Street in those areas? I think it would mostly deal with what exactly those lines are doing, whether they're involved with the culvert system and drainage or actual utilities on the high school site. Yeah. If it was utilities on the high school site or neighboring buildings, they would have to be rebuilt. Um, yeah. For example, where we would put this new building, the electrical mains for both the existing high school and Rumney Marsh run right under there. So some of the first actions we do is move the electrical mains for both of those. If there's other utilities running out under that street that support adjacent buildings, we need to fix those as well. If it's related to drainage, it would be part of the culvert. These work. are not reimbursed, am I correct? Correct, it wouldn't be reimbursed, okay. yep. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors? Councillor Cogliandro? Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> so I, I have to ask, when, when it originally, why is the culvert all of a sudden back with a vengeance? Because originally it was, we don't have to touch it, this is great, now all of a sudden it's back. I'm just curious. Yep. And I have one more question after that. Thank sure. You. So our, our goal was to stay off of it, no, with the building. Um, and all these designs achieved that. As we were meeting with the team studying the culvert, their message to us was, if you're going to be building down there in um, you know, 2025 through 2029, our goal would be to be in there replacing that culvert right around the end of that, after that. So their, their message to us was, we don't want to go in and rip up new roads, new fields. Um, so it more became involved again due to timing. Its, it's failure is imminent, um, and it has to get done. The question becomes, can it be done in parallel without holding this project up? The only other option would be to build this project and then rip up the whole access road and fields to fix the pipe underneath it. So, Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. There's a lot of talk about um, having a push going back to Wonderland. Um, so there's going to be a brand new council. I can't speak for anybody. Um, so if that ever did happen, my one important question is will the MSBA have our back if that happens I certainly can't speak for the MSBA but I think they would um, they have been pretty understanding and accommodating of this process they know this is a huge project they know it's done in an urban area they know Revere's not swimming in space to build it um, you know there's a lot of communities out in Western Mass that it's pretty easy to site one of these buildings especially of the size I think um, they would support it if that does become real, we'll be uh, working with them to get a real answer on that. Thank you. And I just, I just want to let everybody know there's, you know, I'm still concerned about eminent domain costs, very concerned about that. But, um, you know, if that's the intention, we need to know. The new council is going to need to know. This is our last meeting where we truly handle regular business. So, you know, and I would hate for, you know, uh, the new council to not be as informed as it should be on this project so that they can make an educated decision as well. So, and, and as always, thank you for being here, Brian. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Zambudo. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dakin, for your presentation. Um, I understand the culvert is a, is a big expense, and I don't know, we're talking $40 million for the piece that would affect the schedule? Is that what we're talking about, roughly? That was the order yeah. of magnitude okay. CDM Smith gave us, yes. I just want to try to remind everybody that Wonderland property will be taking $1.2 billion off the tax roll. So I just want to put that back on the table here, because over my dead body, it goes back to Wonderland, okay? And, uh, and I think the taxpayers, I think the taxpayers spoke <laughs> fairly uh, strongly about that in this last election. Uh, the bottom line is, 
I like all the options. I, I think I think you've done a good job. I think you put together some good project here, and, and, and I'm looking forward to that being built there. Whether or not we have to build this culvert, and the culvert is not part of the cost of the school, correct? Uh, overall, yes. At, at, at best, it's preferred that if we have a design for between School Street and American Legion Highway, the project builds that piece simply so we're not working well, around I another contract. I understand that. But, but the but overall cost, It's no. the city's responsibility Correct. to build, rebuild this culvert, whether it it's now or five years from now. Absolutely. This culvert's going to have to be rebuilt. Maybe it's 10 years from now. And I, and, and I don't want to get into, uh, uh, let's talk about, well, we, we can guess it's 10 years, or we can guess it's eight years, or it's six years. This culvert's going to have to be replaced, and, 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 and that's part of the reality. But uh, I, I, I don't want to make any comparisons that because of a $40 million culvert, we need to take a piece of property off the tax roll for, for a, a big Madam President, tool. through you to the council to my left, please. Yeah. State your point. Uh, I'm sorry. I just I just have to to speak on something. Um, his his 1.2 billion dollars um, is is out lavish and outlandish number. And I'll tell you where I'm getting this. The 875. I'll say it again. 875 apartments that were just approved in Lynn are going to bring in $125 million over the course of 30 years. So tell me, how are we getting to $1.2 billion? How many apartments is that going to be? I, I, I thought I had the floor, but I'll, I'll, I'll entertain his uh, Please do. query because... Councilor Zambudo, continue. My assumption is that Suffolk Downs is worth $47 million a year in tax revenue to the city. I said, and that's the same acreage as the Wonderland parcel, I said, let's assume it's only worth half as much. Now, I could tell you my vision for that, but then I'd be putting us at risk for our lawsuit. So I didn't, during the campaign, I talked about the 1.2 billion, but I didn't talk about my vision for it because I don't want to put the city in jeopardy, and I'm not going to do that tonight. But I guarantee you that that's worth at least half as much as Suffolk Downs. That's 23 and a half million dollars a year in revenue times the 50-year life of a high school is 1.2 billion. Now, if someone can argue that my numbers are wrong or that that my assumption of half the value of Suffolk Downs is wrong. And, and, and I want little or no apartments in my scheme. And it, it starts with a commuter reel and a lot of other stuff. But I can't go into it, like I said, because it, it would put the city in jeopardy because we're still in a, we're still in a lawsuit over this. Thank so the you. bottom Thank line you. is that $40 million doesn't mean a lot to me compared to the option. And that's where I come up with those numbers. I think that most reasonable people in finance will agree with them. Thank you, Councillor Zambuda, Council of Visconti. Thank you, Madam President. Just one question. Uh, the $40 million that this, this culvert has to get done, whether it's now, whether it's a year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it has to get. Can't that be part, and maybe I, it's a question to uh, uh, Mr. Chiaramella, uh, can't that be part of the consent decree that we're paying now and added to that? Is that, uh, uh, help me understand that, I guess. I mean, because it's something that eventually we're going to have to do, okay? Let's even say we're going to put a middle school back there, right? We're going to have to do that at that time as well, right? Is that my understanding? Um, so it, it, whether it's done now or later where i'm just wondering can that be part of the consent decree that the city is paying and uh for the infrastructure of, of the unfortunately city? it can't be part of the consent decree because it has nothing to do with sso's sanitary sewer overflows that's what landed the city of Rivera in the consent decree with the federal government the believe me i pleaded to get this call of it done in 2018, because in 2018 we had 62 inches of rain. Hmm. In the city, in the, in the state average is 37, 37 to 41 inches of rainfall a year. We had 62 inches of rain. 
So my focus was on stormwater. That's where I got the nickname Donnie Drains. But then it then when I went to my first water break, Donnie saw, Brains. What'd yeah. you say? Brains or Drain, Drains? Drains. Okay. Drains. All right. But then when I then when I I went to one of my first water breaks, I saw tuberculated pipes, and I saw that the firefighters couldn't convey enough water to fight a fire because of a six inch or an eight inch water main was tuberculated down to essentially a two inch or the size of a garden hose. Um, I decided to focus on the water distribution system. Okay. That's where we spent quite a bit of money. But in 2018, when we had that much rain, I, I, I tried to focus our attention on this culvert. The culvert is undersized. We knew it. I've been in it. I've walked in it. I've been spent many hours in it. Um, the culvert is undersized, but we were focusing on maybe just a pump station at the at School Street to to convey the water through this pipe okay. because the pipe isn't large enough, and it effectively runs. It, the report says it runs flat. It doesn't run flat. It runs uphill. Uphill. So. If I'm standing in that, in that pipe, at near the, the, in the location of School Street, I'm standing in about two feet of water, and as I look toward um, uh, the Rummy Marsh Academy up the pipe, it's high and dry. So okay. it essentially runs uphill. So it wasn't laid pro properly in the 70s. Also, why, so we knew it was an issue, and that's why we did a, re a report, a 190-page report in 2000 for that culvert. This is it. This is specifically for that culvert because it gave the city of Revere so much issue. But again, in 2005, we ended up in a consent decree, so we had to spend almost a quarter of a billion, billion dollars on sewer issues, and that's what we've been doing. Okay. And, and so to take monies... And, and focus it on the drainage was, was wasn't even completely. in question. Like no, no, we just I couldn't I, do it. I understand, and I, I guess I, I guess my my, and you answered it. It's been an ongoing problem for but quite some time. But and 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 the only thing I'm saying is, the issue is going to have to be addressed, whether it's now whether it's three years from now, whether it's five years from now, whether it's eight years from now, it's going to need to it, be done. It is, okay. but we put it in our CIP plan so far Far out back, yes. Because I, it was, we have, we have to, year after year, Donnie, we have I understand. to, come, I know come, you got to, to come for monies to line sores to take um, sure. uh, I and I out of the system because no longer can the city of Revere consume three million gallons sure. of drinking water a day, but discharge seven million gallons to Deer Island, yeah. and on a rainy day consume the same static number of three million gallons of water a day, but discharge thirty million gallons to Deer Island a day. We can't do that anymore. Yeah. We can't take that that groundwater. We can't take that rainwater and send it to Deer Island and expect them to treat it. Sure. And expect the expect the residents to pay for that because yeah. that's what they're paying for in their in this in their in their sore rate. So we have to focus on getting the getting the sewer system so that we do not have SSOs sanitary sewer overflows in the street where it's a public hazard, and that we aren't sending I and I illegal infiltration of water to Deer Island to treat green yeah. groundwater that. It's it's, it's it's. I understand. It's, it's, it's salt water. I I understand where you're coming from. I guess my my point was just that this this problem, whatever is built at that location, that problem will have to be addressed prior to any construction on that um, yeah. on that um, parcel of land. That's all. Thank you, Donnie. I appreciate oh, that. Thank no, you. No, don't bother. Thank you, Councilor. You're, you're fine. Councilor Marabito. Mr. Chair Mello, one minute. Yeah. Uh, on, just out of curiosity, in that 190-page report, um, how much was it to fix the culvert? Back in 2000, um, I, I don't think we had. We, so we it didn't go to design. All we did was we recognized the problem and where all the problems stemmed. So it wasn't just the culvert; it's upstream of the culvert. 
And if, you may, if I may. I have, I have about a sixth of the city that goes through that high school site. A sixth of the city. It's 462 acres of catchment area on, on that high school site that's conveyed through, the, through that property. This is, this is all that area that from Gore, Derby, which goes through and crosses Broadway and then goes through the Ambrose Park, the Rumney Marsh Academy, and then you have all the way up to Fennos Hill and Proctor and Mountain Ave that goes through the fire station, Walgreens parking lot, again through um, uh, uh, the um, Rite Aid parking lot, crosses Broadway, and by the way, Today, today, this is how it crosses Broadway. This is a granite box culvert that probably at one time wagons crossed over a wooden bridge and, and the city covered it over with granite slabs and that exists today. That's standing, this is standing water today. Two feet constant. Here's the three foot, here's the two foot mark. Here's the three foot mark. This is all granite. This is today. This is today. This is, this, is connect, this is under Broadway, and this is what this report, is just so much of Revere that goes through that culvert. So it's not, it's, 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 it's just not fixing that culvert. We have to, that culvert does have to be fixed, but all of upstream needs to be fixed too because flood, flooding issues will not resolve. So, but back in 2000, was there any conversations about, or estimates about like what it would have cost? Back then, so there was. There was I'm just trying to get an idea of ideas, 23 no. years later. Fast forward. Even if they were, so I that I'm not. I'm not privy to any okay. amounts of. But the city since 2000, the city has grown. More has been paved. More we catch more water, whether it be through asphalt driveways, roofs, drainage, conductor pipes, downspouts. We catch more. There are more roofs, there's more driveways, there's more asphalt, there's more impervious surface. So what we caught 2000 is definitely, it's more now that what, you know, 23 years fast forward, we're catching more of that water and we're directing more through, through our drainage system. I have 19 miles of drainage pipes, 19 miles of drainage pipes connected that go through that culvert. So it's really just not addressing the culvert. It's a, it's, a, it's a really a bigger issue. But the culvert needs to be done. It needed to be done 10, you know, 10 years ago. It needed to be done 20 years ago. But we were in, well, 2005, but we were in a consent decree. And I don't, wouldn't even, I would be embarrassed to come to, this, to, to the city and say, hey, I need, you know, three or four million dollars for stormwater when I've got, I had, we had sewage running in the street and our water system is in like all cities and towns in this country was left ignored and i'm not saying it's just revere it's all cities and towns what was below our feet we were just impervious to it we, we were just i mean we were just oblivious to the fact that what was underneath our feet was decaying and and, and you know and in in, in deplorable shape the bridges you drive over the tunnels you drive through were in in, in, in terrible shape but the, the, the country finally got together and said, hey, we need infrastructure. You know, we need to work on infrastructure. And the, and the cities and towns woke up on it too. So right now, because of the danger of fire, so flooding is an issue. And believe me, I don't take it, I don't take it lightly when people get flooded. It's, it's, it's a lousy thing to get flooded with stormwater. I weighed it. And I said, well... I have flooding. People call me because of flooding. There's a foot of water in Sewell Street, Library Street. I understand. I apologize. I'm sorry. Our drainage system is miserably undersized. It's, it's inadequate. We need to do a lot of work. Thank but you, Donnie. But then when I saw the water system, I said, well, you know, let's work on water because the danger of fire traveling through neighborhoods is greater. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Um, I just have a question, permission to speak. Um, when did uh, we start having meetings with CDM Smith uh, about the culvert? Was it? Uh, I think um, we've had a few of them, mostly started this summer. It started this summer. So it started yep. before these, uh, the new meetings um, uh, started? 
Um, we started in May with the new meetings. Yeah. Okay. I think I think I could look it up, but I think the first I had a number of calls with their project manager, and then we've gotten our team together with their team probably two or three times summer up until about a month ago. A month ago, we left them with um, they sort of said by the end of this year, by January, by this December, they should have a much better idea of what the design um, might be, and that's we were really trying to get them to a design so we could know when it can get put in the ground and how much money it would be, et cetera. So, so I've, I've been on the building committee for, since May, and this has never been brought up until the last month. Um, so I'm a little confused about this. Um, I know there's a COVID problem. Um, I, I know that when we did the schematic design, it was 30 feet away from it. You, mm -hmm. you know, I know it was told that we would have a problem, and now all of a sudden we have a problem. Uh, and it's a $40 million problem. So uh, I'm just a little confused of, of you know, uh, this coming up, uh, you know, after six, seven months. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for coming up here and talking, and we'll probably see you next month. Got it. Thank you very much. Moving on. Public hearings, calendar item number four, hearing called is ordered by the Board of Assessors requesting adoption of the minimum residential factor for fiscal year 2024. So we're gonna start off with proponents. Anybody in favor? You come up to the microphone, state your name and address, please. Dana, Branch of 40, 281 Broadway. Uh, tonight, the Board of Assessors would like to recommend that the City Council adopt the residential factor of 0 0.880912. Uh, doing so would allow us to implement the 175% shift, uh, which would give us a commercial and residential tax rate. And it would allow us to um, give the residents the greatest benefit with the lowest tax rate, uh, residential tax rate possible. Great, Tana. Um, thank you. Um, I have a small presentation to go through. I don't know if you want sure. me to do it at the end or do it yeah, now. Yeah, you, you want to do it now, Ashley? Uh, so just, just a quick overview of um, kind of assessed values and taxation uh, for this year. Uh, so this is the levy limit. So this is the amount of taxes uh, that we can raise through real estate and personal property taxes. So we start with last year's limit, which was 107, 656, 370. We're allowed to add 2.5% uh, under the law. So that's the 2.691409. It gives us 110. And uh, we're allowed to add our new growth for the year, which was about 3.3 million. So our total levy, what we're going to be collecting for real estate and personal property taxes for FY24, will be 113 million 715,482. Uh, growth is anything that's new, subject to taxation for the first time. Uh, this can include any new articles of personal property, any previously exempt properties, split and merged uh, parcels that are taxed for the first time, and anything that is increased in valuation uh, due to construction activity. Uh, so again, for this year, our total was at 3.3, and how that broke down was residential added uh, almost 1.8 million, and commercial, industrial, personal property uh, gave us almost 1.6 million. Uh, where did all this growth come from? Uh, so the major contributors to each class uh, for the residential side, uh, 656 Ocean Ave, 646 Ocean Ave, 22 Gibson Way, which was the old G&J towing site, 257 Washington Ave, 50 Salt Street, which is the uh, first phase of HYM, the Amaya building, uh, many new construction homes, and then we have our typical additions, rehabs, renos, things like that. Uh, on the commercial side, uh, we saw the completion of the Amazon site on Squire Road, 731 Revere Beach Parkway uh, was a self-storage facility. Uh, Market Basket, we saw some growth from that because their TIF actually expires uh, in fiscal 23, so it's the end of that. Uh, National Grid, a lot of gas and electrical, Comcast, RCN, Sprint, um, cell towers, things like that uh, on the personal property side. Uh, <clears throat> next slide. 
Um, as far as valuation, Massachusetts law requires that all municipalities establish a full and fair cash value real estate as of January 1, preceding the start of the fiscal year. So for FY24, we're looking at evaluation date January 1, 2023. Uh, to calculate those values, we have to look at the sales market that occurred between January 1, 22 and December 31st, 22. We use a mass appraisal computer software model, which is used to calculate the property values based on the market activities. And of course, everything's adjusted for size, location, quality, style, things like that. Uh, during calendar year 22, we had 1,234 transactions. Of those transactions, 447 were determined to be arm's length transactions. We usually see around 3 to 5% of our housing stock trade by this arm's length transaction each year. The Mass Department of Revenue performs statistical analysis of the city's pro proposed assessments every year. The DOR conducts a comprehensive analysis of the city's appraisal process and reviews the property values in detail to ensure that we are representing the full and fair market value. Every five years, uh, the city performs a full revaluation. Uh, so the reason we're here tonight is the, the minimum residential factor. This is used to make sure uh, the shift of the tax burden complies with the Mass General Laws. Uh, the Acts, Chapter 200 Acts of 1988 amended the law to allow for a larger shift. Uh, prior to that, you were only able to go to 150%. That act allowed us to go to 175. So again, adopting that 88.0912 would allow us to go to, to the 175 shift. In doing so, uh, we would arrive at a residential rate of $9.11 and a commercial rate of $18.10. Last but not least, uh, what does this all mean to our tax bills? Um, so overall, kind of what happened in the major classes uh, in the single family homes, values went up 8.72% on average. Um, so what does that mean in a tax bill? It's about a $200 increase uh, for the year. Condominiums went up 6.3% on average uh, with an average increase of $65. Two families, just over 9% value increase, just over $300 increase in the tax bill. Three families, almost 5% increase in values, uh, not too much of, of an increase in taxes. Apartments overall were up about 14%. Um, they'll see a, a major increase of about 10% in their tax bill. Uh, commercial and mixed-use properties were up around 11%, and they'll see you know, a 9 to 10% increase uh, in their tax bills. Uh, the tax rate went down approximately 4.21% uh, residential and 4.64% uh, on the commercial side. So that is my summary in a nutshell. Thank you, Dana. Any other proponents? I'm going to close that side. Opponents? Anybody that are, is not in favor? I'm going to close that side. Councillors, any councillors want to speak? Okay. Move the question. Okay. What? All in favor? No. Oh. Roll, roll call. Shall the city council adopt a minimum residential factor of 0 0.880912 to enable the Board of Assessors to proceed with the establishment of the fiscal year 2024 tax rate? Councilor Cogliandro. Yes. Yes, Councilor Morbido. Is absent, Councilor Novoselsky. Yes. Yes, Councilor Powers. Yes. Yes, Councilor Rizzo. Yes. Yes, Councilor Serino. Yes. Yes, Councilor Silvestri. Yes. Yes, Councilor Visconti. Yes. Yes, Councilor Zambudo. Yes. Yes, and President McKenna. Yes. Yes, the minimum residential factor has been adopted. Unfinished business, calendar item number five, an ordinance further amending the revised ordinances of the City of Revere relative to the Assistant City Clerk and Zoning Board of Appeals Clerk. Thank you. Move the question. Order to a second reading. Order to a third and final reading. Roll call for engrossment and ordainment. 
Shall the City Council approve an ordinance relative to the Assistant City Clerk and the Zoning Board of Appeals Clerk, Councilor Cogliandro? Yes. Yes. Councilor Morbido? Absent. Is absent. Councilor Novoselsky? Yes. Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. Yes. Councilor Rizzo? Yes. Yes. Councilor Serino? Yes. Yes. Councilor Silvestri? Yes. Yes. Councilor Visconti? Yes. Yes. Councilor Zambudo? Yes. Yes. And President McKenna? Yes. Yes. The ordinance is engrossed and ordained. Calendar item number six is the zoning subcommittee report. Councilor Zambudo. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, as we know, the zoning subcommittee met at five this evening. We had three items on the agenda. The first one was uh, Nicholas Jacoby, 164 Harris Street, 23-263. That was continued. Next up was uh, Beachmont Post, uh, 6712 Veterans of Foreign Wars, 23 264. That's voted out favorably, and uh, I'd ask for a roll call as amended. Roll call. Shall the City Council grant the relief requested subject to the conditions as reported by the Zoning Subcommittee and the City Planner? Councilor Cogliandro? Yes. Yes. Councilor Morbido is absent. Councilor Novoselsky? Yes. Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. Yes. Councilor Rizzo? Yes. Yes. Councilor Serino? Yes. Yes. Councilor Silvestri? Yes. Yes. Councilor Visconti? Yes. Yes. Councilor Zambudo? Yes. Yes. And President McKenna? Yes. Yes. The special permit has been granted. Next up is 23-251, uh, uh, zoning orders further amending uh, the revived ordinances of the City of Revere, establishing Green Street and Shirley Ave, Smart Grote Overlay Districts, pursuing to Mass General Law, Chapter 40R. That was also voted out favorably, and I'd ask for a roll call. Roll call. Order is a second reading as amendment as amended. Order as a third and final reading as amendment as amendment. <laughs> Bow call for engrossment and endowment. Shall the City Council approve a zoning ordinance further amending the revised ordinances of the City of Revere by establishing Green Street and Shirley Avenue smart growth overlay districts? Pursuant to Mass Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40R, as amended. Councilor Cogliandro? Yes. Yes. Councilor Morabito? Is absent. Councilor Novoselsky? Yes. Yes. Councilor Powers? Yes. Yes. Councilor Rizzo? Yes. Yes. Councilor Serino? Yes. Yes. Councilor Silvestri? Yes. Yes. Councilor Visconti? Yes. Yes. Councilor Zambudo? Yes. Yes. And President McKenna? Yes. Yes. The ordinance is engrossed and ordained. Next up is the Legislative Affairs Subcommittee Report. Madam President. Councilman Ovisowski. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Councilor uh, Morbido in Home 6, so I will be given the uh, report. Okay. Well, Thank you. Um, Legislative Affairs Subcommittee report, uh, met uh, earlier today, and uh, they recommended as amended to approve this uh, this request. Any other counselors? All in favor? All opposed? As amendment. As amended. Calendar item number 10, motion presented by Councilor Cogliandro, that the mayor-elect be requested to conduct an investigation through an external source of the city solicitor relative to recent allegations brought to the attention of the administration and city council by multiple city employees. Council Cogliandro. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have to say, I'm very surprised at what's gone on since I filed this, <clears throat> because all I'm asking for is that an investigation should, that should be done in the first place be done through an external source, because I do not believe that a member of the city's hierarchy should be investigated by someone he oversees. That's all I'm asking for. I get a letter here, don't talk about the case, there's pending litigation, I'm not talking about the case. It's not what we're doing here tonight. 
Okay, this is about doing what's right. And unfortunately, I had to put someone's name on it. Uh, because if I just generally said that's what we should do, then it, nothing would happen. And in this letter from attorney Matt Buckley, it says, the mayor is responsible and makes the sole decision for things like that. And I want to say that's exactly why I'm asking him to do it. That's exactly why I'm asking him to do it. Okay, about a week and a half ago, the, the acting mayor, the city solicitor, the city clerk, and the city council president received uh, an email from an attorney representing a former city employee. It was then sent to the entire city council at the request of the council president, which is in no way, shape, or form abnormal. The city council just received, uh, excuse me, the city council president just received information that there was a threat on the lives of the city council, and she then relayed that information to us. I don't see anybody complaining about that. It is a very common practice, so we can put this whole everybody's in cahoots thing to bed. In the email, there were complaints from three city employees against the solicitor involving gender discrimination and harassment. Okay, so this is about transparency and doing the right thing. I don't care who's innocent. I don't care who's guilty. That is not my concern. My concern is making sure that the process is done fairly and handled correctly with full transparency. Apparently, that is a huge problem for some of the people in this building. Because the, that day, two hours later, I was called. I was told, I don't have the right to file this. This motion makes the city look bad. Public perception can hurt the city in court. The business should not be discussed in the city council chambers. And my favorite, you're only doing this to put yourself in the public eye. Let me inform you that the, and let me inform the entire city, actually, that we are well within our rights as a city council to ask for an investigation to be done. I'm not sitting here launching one of my own. I'm not demanding it. We are asking that it be done properly. I went back to 2010. 2010, I went through every single city council agenda, every single video, and on many occasions, the city council has asked to investigate one thing or another. Keeping things quiet, that's the status quo. Don't let the public know what's happening. Well, I feel as a resident that I have every right to know what's going on with the employees whose salaries I pay along with the rest of the residents in this city. I was asked why I didn't call the solicitor because this wasn't an issue that he could agree to or not agree to. Even today, he accused me of doing the dirty work for a disgruntled employee. Can you believe that? I was asked why I didn't call the mayor. For the same reason I want the investigation to be from an external source and transparent, especially given that I was told that there would not be support from the administration on this motion. Later that night, I received a call from a colleague that I was threatened. I was threatened that they were going to dig up some past information on me, that they were going to, uh, let, me, let me get the quote, people with a past shouldn't be making waves. Be ashamed if that information got out. Moving on to the next morning, I received another phone call from the same colleague who informed me that the same person in a group text with all city employees threatened the entire council, all of us, that she was going to launch investigations on counselors. I quote, can't wait to open my investigations on counselors. Making threats to release public or private information about anyone in an attempt to intimidate, to withdraw the motion is clearly retaliation for filing. We also call that blackmail. This employee should be fired. I was shocked that an employee would threaten to release information about a city councilor's past over a motion that was filed asking for an external investigation. I challenged them to post or share anything. We have nothing to hide. So if public information about this council is shared, I ask that you do one thing. Do not just read the headline, read the article as well. This, ex <laughs> this external investigation that I'm asking for could not only clear someone name, someone's name, but give the findings validity knowing that it was done externally and not here in this building. There was nothing to hide or worry about. I would have guessed people would be thankful for this motion. 
You know, how many times as city councilors have we had the opportunity to say something and not said a word? And how many times have we had the opportunity to act and not acted, all because we're afraid we're going to hurt somebody's feelings? I have worked to never be that type of politician, and I'll never be that person again. Not after this experience, and not after seeing the nasty side of City Hall again. An unfortunate truth is that we as city councilors cannot do anything without it being put under a political microscope. Election year or not, it doesn't matter. Every motion filed, every issue tackled, everyone wants to know what side you're on and who you stand with. It's ridiculous. Be because some of us are up here and we're our own people and we're up here trying to do the right thing. I have been told more stories of harassment, retaliation, intimidation, blackmail, gender discrimination in this city than anyone could imagine. The problem is that nobody speaks up about it because they know nothing will be done or they are scared to lose their job or scared that their character will be assassinated. Now let's go back to the beginning. What's the actual motion? We're asking that an investigation that's already going to be done should be done outside the city. Wow. I'm sorry, but threats being accosted shouldn't have happened. So I ask all of you, please support this because it's the beginning of a fight that we so sorely need in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors? <laughs> Councillor Silvestri. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you, Councillor, for filing this motion. And um, it maybe this piece of paper here is right. Um, you know, maybe this should have been put in executive session, but it wasn't, um, and it was filed. And when it was filed, we were threatened. And you know what? Sometimes two plus two equals four. And when the dots connect and they continuously go back to the same area, then something needs to be done. And I have to say, in doing my own research and talking to several employees, I have a concern with the city solicitor's behavior in and outside of this building. I have a concern with, with his behaviors, and I ask the mayor, if he does not want this to be a public issue, please do something, sir. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rizzo. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first off, you know, I, I've worked with the city solicitor for close to two decades, and to my knowledge, he doesn't have a blemish on his record. So, you know, uh, Whenever something like this, there's, a, there's allegations out there against him. Um, obviously, if it was against him or any other municipal employee, it needs to be investigated. So that goes without saying. Um, what's bothering me the most about not necessarily the motion, but the dialogue surrounding the motion, is this environment and its it's new to me, it's only over the last several years that we've seen these threats and intimidations coming towards elected officials. Uh, I mean, Madam President, you were a victim of it. We talked about this at length at one of our council meetings. And I mean, how much more are we going to allow municipal employees to threaten elected officials? I mean, what kind of precedent is this setting? You know, uh, I, think, I think we need to, de that definitely needs action on behalf of this city council. Municipal employees need to understand they work for the city. We're elected by people who vote here in the city. And for them to be launching threats at any councilor, at any councilor, I mean, any councilor who chooses not to support this, I mean, you know, I can't understand how, why you wouldn't, because if it's not you, it could be somebody else. It could be a member of the next city council that gets threatened. You know, I mean, this has to stop. This intimidation and threats 
or this environment that we have of intimidation and threats cannot continue because it's a slippery slope. And if we allow it to happen now, it's only going to get worse. So, um, you know, while I completely respect the city solicitor and have the highest regard for him, uh, you know, I don't have any, there's, 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 I mean, he's always been, to me, a dedicated, trusted city employee. Um, but again, it's the dialogue that's around it. It's the, it's the issue of transparency. It's the issue of threats and intimidation. And I think we all need to support this motion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Zambudo. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, I'm not going to impugn anybody's character here, but I support my colleague 100% with his motion. I mean, this, I don't know who said what, who did what, but just, just the facts that, that have come out here are just unbelievable. And, you know, I've been here a long time, and I do have a lot of respect for the city solicitor that I've known over the years. And I, I don't want to believe that he's part of this intimidation. But, uh, you know, we've got a letter here that we're not going to talk about details, so I'm not going to talk about details. I just want to say that uh, I support my colleague 100%, and I stand behind him, and I've got his back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors? Okay, all in favor? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Robert Maurer <clears throat> from the Mayor's Office, 281 Broadway. Um, it's pretty clear which way the City Council is, is aiming uh, in respect to uh, Councilor Cogliano's motion. But I would point out to the City Council that this is beyond the scope of the City Council. The City Council is a legislative body. The City Council is not a human resources department. The City Council's function is, as established in the City Charter, in City Ordinance, and State Law, is to enact and perform the function of enacting legislation. When the City Council takes a step like this, in these circumstances, it sends a dangerous message to employees across the road. I don't question, Councilor Cogliantra, your integrity in wanting to do the right thing. But this is more a matter of the City Council's authority in and of itself, not with respect to this one individual or one individual situation. There's a human resources department that handles human resources matters, and that's what this is. Random discussion, and, and I would suggest that the discussion has already gone beyond what it should outside of, executive dis outside of executive session. But random discussion of human resources issues in this body, in addition to exceeding the scope of the council's charge, it creates uncertainty in municipal staff, it undermines the function of the human resources department, it impairs the city's ability to deal with employment issues in a consistent manner, it creates confusion about the proper channels of employee grievance. It misleads the public by casting aspersion, in this case on the solicitor's office, without premise. It's not unusual that matters that end up in front of the Human Resources Department might take place in the anticipation of litigation. Random discussion, again, like we're hearing tonight, random discussion can subvert the city's legal position and legal standing when a complaint follows its proper procedures. So, again, I don't question Councilor Cogliandros or any of you councilors with your sincerity in wanting to protect the integrity of municipal employment. But this type of motion, it, it simply exceeds the, the council's, I know you do, uh, Councilor, I, I would expect that, I, and, I, can, and I, I anticipate that most people will. But the point is, it exceeds the statutory and the statutory authority, the authority invested in this city council by our city charter and state law. The council should focus on its function. And when certain things come up, and we use the password of transparency, 
the password doesn't necessarily empower the council to do something that it otherwise isn't empowered to. This is a human resources matter. And that's where the slippery slope can begin, where any time there's a human resources complaint, someone can come to a city council and expect the city council, in their good intentions, to now launch an investigation. And that really subverts the human resources process in the way these things are supposed to be dealt with. So I would encourage the city council to consider, on behalf of uh, Acting Mayor Keefe, I encourage the city council to consider what the role is here and really what this can entail in terms not of just this situation, but of future situations. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Cogliandro. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Mara, thank you for being yeah, it's if you if you want to stay up there, go ahead. I just want to thank you for being here. I know this is a not ideal. You're getting thrown up here for this is a very heated topic tonight. I just want to talk about the focus on the function of the council. I was elected to take care of people. And if they come to me with a problem that's not being handled properly, you can bet that I'm gonna handle it properly. That's that's why that's why when I got those emails, I filed and and, and first of all, Second of all, rather, we're not, we're not the ones launching the investigation here. It's from what I was told, and I'm not going to throw people under the bus, but there's already an investigation in place. All we're doing is simply asking for it to be done externally. I can absolutely, any of us in here can absolutely ask. Ask. That's all we're doing. We can ask to have an investigation done. That is not outside the view of this council's job. We get elected by the people by the people, and they want us to take care of them, and they want transparency, okay? We do have the authority to file to ask. We absolutely do. Um, uh, but you're, you're right. We don't have the authority to say what happens. That's why, again, I asked the mayor to do this. He can say no, but I'm still asking him to do it. Like I said, we have... I, I don't. I don't believe we're undermining the. <clears throat> we're undermining the function of the human resources department. They're going to have an investigation anyway. But let me ask you: Do you believe that somebody who oversees that department should be investigated by them? Let's poll the audience because I think it's a unanimous no. But counselor, that gets to a more specific question instead of the broader question. It's not a micro question. It's a macro question, and that is: Yes, the, the electorate elects all of you. But the city charter and state law and city ordinance says what your responsibilities are. And it specifically says in the city charter and state law and city ordinance that the city council has legislative powers. So when the city council steps into executive functions such as human resources issues, then it is exceeding the powers that are bestowed on it by the city I, charter. I understand and state what law. you're saying. And, and again, I, th I mean, this is a, obviously a discussion that would be an entertaining intellectual discussion. But, uh, <laughs> it's entertaining right now, I'm sure I'm being honest. Is. But, I, but I, I, again, I, I revert back not to the micro question of any one particular investigation, but to the macro question of what, does, what is a city council's authority. And what this does is it encourages the notion that if I've got a complaint with my boss, I can go to the city council and launch an investigation. And that subverts a consistent and routine manner of human resources processes within the city. I think you're 100% incorrect in the fact because the motion itself, in nowhere does it say that we are launching an investigation. <laughs> I go, I go, I'm, I'm kind of losing my mind here. I'm going back to the point where we are just asking. We aren't launching, we're not demanding. We are asking for the mayor to do that, and if he says no, he says no. We're not launching anything. I, I, I don't understand the argument here. I, we, we can there's go. Other my, there's other items on the agenda, and I know we don't want to go back and uh, forth. Listen, I got all night, buddy. Uh, well, I don't know if the rest of the council, all these folks do, but the point is that the, 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 the distinction that you're making is it's kind of a distinction without a difference. And that is, once the city council asks the mayor to do something, unless the mayor takes a specific affirmative action of saying, no, I'm not going to do it, and throws it back at you, you know that that then becomes 
a, an order of the city council. And it's it's not a law, it's not an ordinance, it's not like any of the other material, any of the other matters that come before this board that are within the pr jurisprudence of this board. So again, I'm stepping back and I'm asking the council to step back and consider the ramifications of this kind of action. Again, not in one specific case, but in general, where the city council hears of a human resources issue and then asks the mayor to conduct an external investigation of it. I happen to like our human resources department. Lena Tremelli does a phenomenal job. I just spoke to her today. She's great. This has nothing to do with undermining them. This has everything to do with sending this outside the city so there's no conflict of interest. That's but, all this is about. And I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Maher, again, full respect for you. I'm sorry you're the one up here. I wish the mayor came up to talk, but um, it, we got this letter. I just want to show everybody we got this letter today trying to, trying to shut us up about this. We didn't talk about the case. We just talked about the email we got. I just want to make that clear. But um, all I'm going to say is if you go back and look, the city council is well within its right to ask the mayor to do something. That's all. And he, if he says no, he says no. We're not launching anything. I, I, I understand what you're saying. You're going to go back and you're looking into the city charter and all that stuff. That's fine. But at the end of the day, there's, three, there's allegations out there from three employees that we got at the same time. I want to make sure it's done externally so it's done properly. That's it. And, and you want to know something? We, could, we can argue this back and forth, what our ability is and what not. Maybe we can get a second opinion from, from a lawyer on it. I don't know. But that you know. seems that seems to happen every once in a while. Yeah, it's a co common practice lately. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Silvestri. Bob, thank you for coming up here. Um, as you know, I have the utmost respect for you. Um, I really do, and uh, I am too sorry that that you're up here tonight. Um, I I have to disagree in in one area, um, and that is that. When, when lawsuits become an issue um, and monies start transpiring and, and over and over and over again, I think there's a time for us to then look at the problem and then to get an answer. And if issues or, or wrongdoings aren't being held or, or people being held to the same standards across the board, I think there's, a, there's a, an obligation for us to look into things. And, and thank you for coming up here tonight. And, Council, I, I would just say in response to that, I agree with you wholeheartedly that there is a process to address these types of grievances. Two of the matters that you have been um, uh, informed of are following that process. It's in the judicial process. What concerns me about this type of motion is the fact that it goes outside of that process because the process would be human resources, investigation you know, within, within the human resources department, a remedy, whether it be a reprimand or a dismissal or whatever it might be. And if the, if the employee is dissatisfied with that, there are then other avenues, proper product, protocols, to follow to address those types of issues. And that's what creates the consistency in the city's handling of things, but it also creates the expectation of consistency. Something like this disrupts that expectation because it says, I'm not going to bother with city with uh, human resources. I'm going to talk to my city councilor. And I think that puts the council in a bad position as well as it puts the, the city employment in bad position. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, Councilor Serino. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I wasn't going to, I'm not speaking on the motion itself. What I take exception to, with all due respect to Mr. Mara, I take exception that the position of the mayor's office seems to not change, but the position of the mayor's office in terms of telling the city council what we can and cannot and what's in our scope and what's not in our scope. As Councillor Cogliandro said, all we are doing is asking that the mayor take action. We are not launching. We are not. All we're doing is asking that he look into this and that he perform, he requests the outside investigation. You know, you look back, 
our legislative function, just for example, with regard to choosing a site for the uh, Revere High School, that is solely our decision in order to move that, that issue forward. Yet the administration, the previous administration, lobbied all of us and asked, asked all of us to consider Wonderland and really urged us on, on that issue. So it's not uncommon, it goes both ways, and it's not uncommon that the city council asks the mayor to do things or that the mayor basically tells us, or you know, it's usually he tells us, but usually asks uh, the city council to take action. So I just, I feel with all due respect, I think it's another slap in the face to the city council that the administration comes up and tries to tell us what is and what is not in our purview. Thank you. And, and, Thank I, you, and I would simply say that it's, it's not the administration that's telling anybody. For example, the school department, I mean, the, um, the high school example, you've got to authorize the money. So that's got to come before, before you guys. Because if you don't say yes, the money's not there. This is a distinct situation. And it's not the mayor telling you or any city council what they can or cannot do. It's the mayor reminding, in this case, the mayor's office reminding the council of the authority that is granted to the city council by state law, by the city charter, and by ordinance. And I see Tony's signal and I get it, so I'm done. Thank you, Bobby. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, so ordered. Calendar item number 11, motion presented by Councilor Cogliandro that the mayor-elect and director of Parks and Recreation appear before the city council to discuss the classes offered at the new Health and Wellness Center. Further, that they discuss the impact of offering these classes at a largely discounted rate, which will impact local small businesses and potentially hurt their revenue. Councilor Cogliandro. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm gonna ask to place this on file. I had a great talk. Uh, with uh, Mike Kenahosa, the director of Parks and Rec. He uh, explained things to me thoroughly. He actually is very, uh, very much mindful of the small businesses in the community. Um, and unless there's any opposition, I'd, I'd like to uh, just place it on file. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? All in favor? All in favor, all opposed, so ordered. I'll place on file, sorry. Calendar item number 12, motion presented by Councilor Serino, that the mayor-elect request the Traffic Commission to examine the feasibility of extending the left lane split on Washington Avenue at Sherman Street in Linden Square to help ease traffic backup on Washington Avenue. Councilor Serino. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, basically the motion speaks for itself, but earlier in my tenure, I wanna say in 2020, shortly after I was elected, I asked for a uh, similar request that they extend that lane it never really went anywhere. However, I want to give kudos to Acting Mayor Keefe because he did, he uh, told me last week that this was something, the same resident must have contacted him as well. Uh, so a resident contacted me to ask that I place it on the agenda. In talking with Acting Mayor Keefe, he is also going to pursue this. So hopefully, you know, come the new year, this will actually be done. So I want to thank the Acting Mayor for his commitment to looking into it and, and getting it done, but also just want to get it on the agenda for the next Traffic Commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. All in favor? All opposed? So ordered. Calendar item number 13, motion presented by Councilor Zambudo that the city clerk be requested to install a perpetual plaque in the city councilor Joseph A. Del Grasso city council chambers in recognition and honor of all women who have served and will serve on the Revere city council. The plaque will be similar to that of the perpetual plaque honoring all city council presidents, which is currently installed at the rear of the chambers. Councilor Zambudo. Uh, thank you, Madam President. This uh, really speaks for itself. Uh, this is this is a way of honoring all women before. Thank you, Councillor. Now and after, and uh, I thank think you, it's Counselor. the I think it's the fairest way to do this, uh, as we don't have a million pieces of wall in the in the uh, city council chamber. So I think that that is a a great way to honor women uh, that have served, are serving, and will serve. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. All in favor? All opposed? So ordered. Calendar item number 14, motion presented by Councillor Powers, 
that the mayor elect be requested to submit an appropriation request to the city council from the community improvement trust fund in the amount of $23,000 for three air quality sensors to be installed in ward five and in addition to the city's existing sensor network. Councilor Powers. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have been uh, requested uh, to uh, put this motion in and I think uh, it deals directly uh, with the controversy that's been made uh, by people down on the riverside and other sections of the city. Uh, people, I believe they have a right to be concerned. Uh, if there's a problem with the air coming out of that uh, site over in Sargas, it should be addressed. And the only way we're ever going to find that out is if these monitoring systems are put into effect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. State your name and address for the book, please. Angela Garino Sawayo, Ward 5 Councilor elect 15 Bateman Ave. Um, good evening, Madam President and Honorable Council. I thank you, Councilor Powers, for presenting this motion. This is a part of my testimony in front of the Joint Council last month um, at the State House. I requested that three air quality monitors be installed in the Point of Pines, Oak Island, and Riverside areas. We are overburdened with multiple sources of pollution. We are an environmental justice community, and we need to know what pollutants we are dealing with. These monitors will help us get a better picture of the amount and type of pollution that impacts the quality of life and health of all the residents in the neighborhoods, all the residents in Ward 5. One of the causes of this air pollution is from the underlying, uh, the overflying aircraft con constantly over Ward 5. Aircrafts in the Point of Pines are doing so at 1500 altitude and the pollution may be invisible, but it's definitely there and it's hurting people. Changing air aircraft flight patterns, which happened over the summer, also causes this to happen and, and to hurt sections of Revere. It's put a bur burden on all of us, and it's very, very important that we do approve this tonight. The automobile traffic pollution that's going through, uh, the pollution coming from wheel abrader is also another factor. I ask this council to vote in favor of this tonight so we can do the research that we need and the studies and we can mitigate these health concerns that we have in, in these areas. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Any other Madam counselors? Pres thank you Councilor for your input. Counselor, thank you for your input, thank Councilor elect. And uh, I think the time for patience and, and delay has come and gone, and it's time to get this moving. Thank you. Councilor Zambudo. Thank you. I don't, I, I don't have a big problem with this motion, except it's asking for monitors. There's no specification of these monitors. There were monitors put up uh, in, in Gibson Park, and, and yet it was put up by a... Uh, uh, and it was monitored by a, a college professor who no longer works there anymore because he, he purported the wind uh, uh, coming from wheel abrader, and it turned out it was coming from the ocean side. So I, I want to know what kind of monitors. I don't care if it's three times the money. I want accurate <laughs> monitors that actually count the pollution of where it's coming from. And at the time Gibson Park's monitor was up there, they're digging... For the, for the new project right next to the monitor. And I, I, it, it's a little weird how you, can, you can't test when you've got this kind of activity going on. So I'm in favor of air quality monitors. I want them to be of high quality, and I want accurate readings and not made-up stuff. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I would like to speak from the chair, please. Um, I have a monitor in my yard. It's been uh, monitoring uh, emissions uh, pollution from the airport. It's been in my yard for five years, and Tuff University takes care of it. And every, every week, they have students that are in the program come and take the data. I don't know when the data will be released, but I can tell you that Massport has had a study for six years on emissions and, and found it inconclusive because they couldn't, uh, they, they couldn't decide whether if, if it was uh, uh, 
truck pollution, car pollution, or airplane pollution. So we got no results after a six-year study. Um, these, uh, this school is willing to give us the data on what they're collecting, and I don't know if anybody knows where I live, but I live right over the flight pattern in Beachmont, and they come 400 feet and less than that. I can see what they're giving out for snacks. That's how close they are to my house. So um, if that happens, in the future, and they do release the data, you'll be the first to know about what's going on in Beachmont and hopefully in the whole city. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record, please. Tom Skorowski, 781 Broadway, uh, 281 Broadway, sorry. Um, Chief of Planning and Community Development. I just want to speak on um, Councillor Zambudo's um, question. And the, the census. Uh, that are being requested here are Quantic Hue sensors. They're state-of-the-art, um, best-in-class sensors for measuring air quality. And I think, I, I don't know full well the situation you're referring to, but I, what I do understand is the problem often with these air quality sensors is not the data that they're collecting, but it's how we interpret it, which maybe is what you're alluding to there. I mean, I completely agree. It's hard to separate the noise from sort of causation and what the data is really telling us. Um, and the purpose for these three sensors, in addition to another we have in the office, is to implement it in a research-oriented way, working with Northeastern University and their iSuper program um, to separate you know, all the noise from the data and identify causality here so we're not making spurious claims. Uh, if I might, uh, Madam President. The, Counselor. The, the problem, especially with this area, is uh, the, the big push is that it's wind waste causing the pollution. We all know that's monitored by DP, and if they go over the NOx levels, it's, it's fine, and they don't. But that's not the point. The point is you've got all kinds of different situations there. You've got 1A that goes up there. You've got 100 planes a night six feet over the houses. You've got, uh, you got construction going on. There's just so many different things happening, how you can pinpoint it, and that's why, I, and I don't want to get back to that professor that happened to get fired for, for going to a public meeting and giving false information, and, and uh, people got the data later and found out that it was, it was completely inaccurate. This sounds like a, a noble goal here with real, with people really trying to do it. If you tell me these are state-of-the-art monitors, then I'm in favor of it. So, uh, but we got to understand what's separate from reality. There's, there's emotion and there's reality. There's several things going on there, and I'll be the first to complain if, if you can prove that these uh, pollutants are coming from the waste to energy plant, but I don't believe it can. Thank you. Thank you. Any other any other counselors? All in favor? All opposed? So ordered. Calendar item number 15, motion presented by Councilor Powers that the mayor elect be requested to submit an appropriation request to the city council from the Community Improvement Trust Fund for an amount to be determined for the purpose of resurfacing the Oak Island playground with handicap accessible rubberized surface. Councilor Powers. Yes, uh, to the uh, residents and to my colleagues on the city council. Uh, the uh, park in Oak Island is probably the only park in the city that doesn't have a rubberized mat. Okay? And this is something that uh, it's poured in, and it's, some, it's not something you pick up or take out. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with the mulch. The mulch is not that effective. And I think that the people down there in Oak Island certainly deserve this. If, it, if, this, if this saves one child from being injured or worse, then we've spent money well. We've done our job. This is something that we are, we heard controversy earlier, what we should be able to do and not do. Well, this is something that we are responsible to do for the people down there. And it's the only park in the city that doesn't have this. So I hope my colleagues will support this this evening and the mayor will make, move this right out and we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Visconti. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm, I'm in full favor of this uh, motion. Uh, 
I believe we, we chatted about this uh, issue um, at the park, uh, at the budget hearings um, um, this year, knowing that there were problems in, um, with, that, uh, with, that, uh, with that park. So um, it's great, um, Councillor, for putting, thank you for putting this motion in. I know uh, the administration was aware of this, or maybe the previous administration was aware of this uh, and problem. I just love to see this get done because I know there are quite a few kids that utilize that park, and it would be a shame uh, that um, there are needles and stuff like that that have been found in that park. So it would be a shame that we we don't act and, and we're not proactive um, with this. And hopefully we can. There's money in that account. Let's utilize it for the residents. Thank you. And Thank just, you, Councilor. Excuse me, may I, and just, just, just for public information, this money, these monies are coming from CIT fund. They're, they're not coming out of our taxes. When a developer builds something in the city, these are some of the rewards, if you want to call them that, that we do get in return, a certain amount of money that we can handle these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Silvestri. Thank you, Madam President. Um, through you to uh, Councilor Powers. Uh, Councilor Powers, um, the head of our Disabilities Commission and, and ADA Compliance, Ralph DeChico, has reached out to me, and he asked if you would be willing to amend uh, this motion to add in the playground at Paul Revere School. The playground at Paul Revere School currently has wood chips, and uh, that is against ADA compliance. And he's wondering if we could add uh, the Paul Revere School playground into that. Thank you. I, I certainly would have no objection to that. However, I would like to see the, uh, the cost that's involved here and how much monies we have in that uh, CIT fund. And I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other counselors? All in favor, all opposed, so ordered. Late Councilor, motion. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Late motion presented by Councilor Silvestri that the mayor elect request the water and sewer superintendent to appear before the city council to advise the residents of Revere of the potential for lead contamination in pipes and water within the city's water distribution system. Councilor Silvestri. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, um, Chris for coming up tonight and addressing this. I got several phone calls, as I think a few of the other counselors have as well. Um, the, in, in, in speaking with um, Commissioner Chair Mello and, and discussing it, he, he was clear that they couldn't uh, edit or change any of the MWRA pamphlets. They had to send them out as is. They weren't as clear as I thought they could be, so I asked them to come up tonight to address and, and clarify some of that. Thanks. State your name and address for the record, please. All right. Um, are there any like direct questions you would like me to answer, or do you want me to just go do my spiel? Yeah, just if you can overall okay. give us a. All a, right. So as everyone knows, the pants were sent out. These were a requirement for the DEP according to our recent lead and copper rule testing program. I understand they were a little bit alarming, but like you spoke to earlier, we weren't allowed to change any of the wording in those pamphlets. There was literally sections underlined that I was allowed to change. Everything else had to be sent as is. Um, just so everyone understands, our water is provided by the MWRA, and it's one of the best tap waters around, hands down. Um, literally no exceptions. So they, our water comes to the Quabbin Reservoir. It is a highly guarded body of water. And I mean, the only reason these, um, these pamphlets were sent out to every bill paying resident of the city of Revere was we had to obtain 20 lead services to say, well, high risk lead services to sample as per this last year's sampling program. And we were finding it difficult to even find 20. So we had our lead out program. We actually stopped removing lead services for a time so we could then test these services. After the services were tested, we then went back and removed every service. So every service that has been tested to date was removed. Currently, we have an inventory of six known, known lead services in the city. 
that's right now currently. Um, we have a complete lead service survey that has to be done by December 30th. And at that time, it can provide any extra data on services that we know of. But I just want to address everyone, make sure everyone understands that this is 99% lead free, our entire water system. And there's no dire risk. I know. I understand it was alarming, but that's what we had to send out, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other councillors? All in favor? All opposed? So ordered. Councillor Novoselsky would like to give a point. He was Okay. Councillor Novoselsky would like to uh, state a point of personal privilege. Thank Councilor you, Madam Novoselsky. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, we're a very diverse community, and uh, everybody has holidays. You know, we have Christmas holiday coming up, and uh, this coming uh, Thursday is uh, the first day of Hanukkah. And I just hope that uh, everybody has a good holiday. It's the Festival of Lights. And we celebrate our way like every other group celebrates their way. And I just want to let everybody know that on um, Wednesday, December 13th, we will have a menorah once again for the 15th year in a row on City Hall uh, by the flagpoles, and we will have a ceremony lighting the lights on that night. I believe it's the uh, fourth or fifth night uh, of, of the holiday. And I just hope that everybody realizes that despite what's going on in the world now, don't take it out on us. Okay, we want to have a nice ceremony. We're not looking for any protests. We're just looking for everybody to come together, even the non-Jewish people. We've had many non-Jewish people at our ceremonies in the past. And I encourage them to come to learn. And that's what it's all about. You know, I, you know, I, I celebrate both. You know, it's, you know, even though Hanukkah is my main thing, I celebrate the Christmas holiday. I put lights on down at uh, Costa Park. We put kissing balls on Shirley Ave which I've been doing for 15 years again. And I think everybody should be celebrating everybody's holiday. So please come down on December 13th and recognize the holiday and the Festival of Lights. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And um, before we adjourn, I would like to take a moment this, uh, this time to offer a moment of silence and observance of National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day on Thursday, December 7th. Could everybody stand and take a moment of silence? Thank you. This meeting is now stand adjourned on Monday, December 18th. Good night and be safe. <laughs>